we have, a, we have a lot of things to show you that are all preliminary draft material. So everything we show you tonight is subject to change. I want to try to tell you some of the story about how we, we got to what we have so far. And we recognize that there are holes in what we have so far that have to be filled in and corrections to be made. Uh, but we get to pause tonight after a, a pretty intense uh, last eight days and, and uh, share with you some of what we have so far. It takes, us, takes the work that, had been, that it has been built on and building up over the last year or more and takes it to another step, but it's not the end. And I'll explain a little bit about this process so everybody has a good sense of where we are in the timeline. Before I do anything else, I want to make sure you understand that uh, myself and, and Nick Kuhn and um, Ian Lockwood, who get to be the spokespersons tonight on some of the work, are actually speaking for a much, much larger team, a uh, few of whom are sprinkled around the, the back of the room and are likely to jump up and correct us if we miss something important that they spent all night working on. Um, but in, and so uh, they really deserve the credit for this. But Jennifer Smith from the county and Amy Groves from our office have been the ones herding the team over the last uh, week and many months leading up to this point. So uh, join me in thanking Amy and Jennifer for getting this together. Now, we can't say enough about the process that's going on, and I want to make sure you understand the process is only partway done. But a lot preceded what we have here. And so just to go back a little bit and make sure that some of you who are coming to your first meeting tonight know uh, how this happened, I, I think it's important to remind you about some of the steps that were completed uh, already. You know, the county started this work with an in intensive amount of study uh, in-house in the county planning department and with two important groups appointed uh, to assist in the process. There's a working group which consists of some staff and leaders from various uh, uh, points of view. And then a larger plenary group uh, which has uh, appointed members representing all kinds of stakeholder groups so that a lot of points of view will be represented. And those two teams have been meeting off and on um, uh, monthly and often more often than a, a monthly uh, over the last year to gather material. They completed an extensive survey of the existing conditions within the Pike neighborhoods, uh, including an analysis of the stock of the affordable housing. And then they worked very hard. Before we ever started putting pen to paper with things like urban design ideas or even economic analysis, they worked very hard to establish some community goals, including preservation of affordable housing, with specific strategies and objectives under each of these goals. And then, uh, around the time we began to get involved and our economists, Abby Ferretti and Anita Morrison, started working on this, we built a catalog of tools, many of existing tools that are used to accomplish those goals, including the affordable housing goals. And then held a meeting many of you attended, looking at, I see familiar faces, called the Tools Forum uh, back in the winter, uh, in which we invited some experts from around the country who have worked with these, with these existing and, and other innovative tools. And so we captured this big list, ideas of new tools, especially for uh, preserving and extending affordable housing. Now, tonight we're doing something a little different. This week, we were able to complete the first step in combining some of the ideas about the built form. We're now moving past just the numbers analysis or the inventory or the lists of tools into imagining together a little bit how things could look or work on the ground in real life bricks and mortar, uh, preservation, construction, tree planting, transportation projects, and so on. Uh, because in the end, the goals are only as good as the design that follows the goals and the execution of those designs to implement the goals downstream. Now, we're a long way from that implementation, but that's the, the design matters a lot. So we've taken a week here to look at how to pull those things in together. Now, meanwhile, the county board recently directed the staff to take on an, an, a detailed evaluation of all the new affordable housing tools. So they're doing that now. Uh, you know, checking for feasibility, checking things against your uh, 
what you have the right to do as a jurisdiction in the Commonwealth of Virginia or what you um, do not under, under state legislation or case law, that kind of thing. Looking at the funding of various ideas and trying to answer the question, how would you pay for that? Or could you ever pay for that? How would private money and public money come together to reach the goals? And so that's all going on. So uh, what you need to think about as you look at slides with us tonight is that the visual things we're going to show you are just part of the story. Okay? There's all that, other, all that other stuff going on simultaneously. Now, the big idea. The big idea is that growth and change are happening in the corridor and that they are inevitable. And in fact, some of the growth and change has, is coming about at long last after waiting a really long time. You know, back in 2002, when uh, this photograph was made on the pike, um, it was a, a picture of the existing conditions over at Adams Square. And you recognize the, the giant in the background on that picture. Uh, this was the existing condition. And not much new had been done on Columbia Pike during that long era of growth and progress uh, in the Roslyn Boston corridor with Metro. Columbia Pike had been waiting for its turn. And people said, get something started, imagine a better future, let's rethink this pike so we can turn it uh, into a corridor of higher confidence for the South County. And don't do all over again exactly what happened in Roslyn, Boston. Do our own thing. Do a South Arlington, Columbia Pike thing. And those pictures from back when that uh, charrette in 2002 happened depicted before and after. Steve Price, are you in the room? There he is. Steve Price made this picture. Uh, you want to see that again for those who haven't seen it before? Before and after. What if someday you had a Columbia Pike streetcar? And what if someday private developer investment would return to the pike and people would build mixed use buildings that had a main street kind of relationship from building to street and sidewalks were wider and walkable? And then above those storefronts, you could have other things like living or working. And of course, this has begun to come true a little bit at a time. And after a lot of work, it's just beginning to happen. And the form-based code and other reforms that were innovated by the county to make this possible were all about getting that ball rolling. The big idea is that now that it's rolling, there are some important next steps to take care of, including that while the pike gets better and better and inevitably becomes more valuable, that backstage of the pike, on the next street over, or the next block over, or in the neighborhoods, or in the garden apartments, and so on, that the things you want, like walkable, sustainable community, or tree-lined streets, or a place where you'd know your neighbors, or a variety of housing types and sizes and prices, so that there can be diversity, that those things you want are still maintained. So the question is, what if about all the rest of the corridor, the, larger picture, not just the pike, but all those other addresses that could be created. And so the, the, the conclusion I can't help but reach is that you, you have this within your grasp. If you want to achieve those quality life goals on the pike, you can make it happen. You've started, so you're proving that. Pretty soon the Columbia Pike streetcar will be rolling on that corridor. Um, the buildings are beginning to accumulate to remake the feeling of the street scene. The improvements are happening. And so if you want to put in place the mechanisms and the design vision to make the things behind the corridor, north and south of it, in the neighborhoods, on the adjacent streets that lead to those main street sections in the so-called revitalization district nodes at the big intersections, if you want that, you can make that happen. Now, here's what we need to do. I want to tell you about the week especially for some of you who didn't come to something prior to this, we'll get a quick sense from you through the keypad polling, assuming keypad polling is in a good mood. Um, who came to what? And that'll give us a sense of, of who's in the room. And then we'll show you some draft com uh, concepts, and we'll get feedback a couple of different ways. Use the keypads again uh, a few times during the, during the meeting, and we'll also have uh, a written questionnaire. So just as we've filled out at a couple of previous meetings, Every time you take the time 
to write down an answer to one of those questions about what's making you nervous or what's got you excited, it will be read. Uh, you have a promise from me and from Jennifer and Amy and uh, your board chair at a minimum and lots of other people will probably make this promise too to read every response we get in those surveys. So every voice will be heard that way. So tonight really is about sharing with you some of those draft concepts and seeing is this what you meant. Now, so the story of how we got here. The, you remember the, the charrette back in 2002 uh, really just concentrated on uh, the uh, big intersections, you know, like the intersection at Walter Reed and Columbia Pike. These so-called revitalization district nodes arrayed along the corridor are logical places because they were commercial or mixed use already. They were the places where the streetcar someday would logically stop and they'd want that to be a hub of activity. So they were covered first and they were made the subject of a brand new uh, kind of land development regulation called the form-based code. The Columbia Pike Special Revitalization District form-based code gives as an alternative to the old zoning. And those who build under it can do cooler things and in exchange they have to meet a lot of design standards that are in that ordinance that are not in the regular zoning. And that it's attractive because they can build according to the form-based code uh, with a simple approval, if they, as long as they follow the standards, instead of a long and complex and drawn out approval. And that's valuable to an investor. So now we move our attention from those nodes. Let me back that up. Move our attention from those nodes to the surrounding areas, the Barcrofts and the Magnolia Commons and the Westmonts and uh, the uh, Foxcroft Heights and, and so on that are arrayed in the area shown here in pink. Now the plenary group is important in this process because you, and their names are here. This is one of two slides. I'll switch it in a second to the second half of the list. There are so many of them that their names don't all fit on one slide. Uh, size where you can read. These are people uh, who are your a direct conduit into the plan because that's a steering committee of a, of a kind that is meeting regularly for updates and to see work in progress. They're giving input on the work. Uh, here's the second set of them. And then what you see is that all kinds of groups are represented here. Um, the, um, the Alliance for Housing Solutions or uh, uh, the Columbia Pike Revitalization Organization and so on. Existing groups that are established uh, are a conduit for you. And you're, we're going to bring this back up again later in the meeting because we have a special job for all of you and the plenary group members uh, later in the week. Now the inventory of the affordable housing, multifamily housing in particular, was, was pretty revealing to us. We actually got to the numbers. How many of them are there? How is it that they turn out to be affordable? the vast majority of the 6,000 or so affordable housing units in the corridor are so-called market rate affordable units, which means they are inexpensive only because a low price is the most the market will bear in that location. That's the most the landlord can get for them, so that's how much they charge. Meaning that as pressure rises on those um, great locations that or near a new transit stop or what have you, there will be a tendency for those rents to rise. There will be a tendency uh, in the future for the landlords to, say, renovate the units and then start charging a higher rent. And so to the extent that afford maintaining affordable housing in large numbers is important, we have to anticipate that this is coming. It hasn't happened in a huge way yet, but it is beginning. Now another thousand or so are so-called committed affordable units, which for one in one way or another are promised to remain at affordable prices for a long period of time. So 5,000 uh, market rate affordable, market affordable units. The Tools Forum was important for me. We had a group of people who came and gave advice from uh, all points of view around the country where a similar problem has been tackled in an innovative way. And each of them told stories, some of them about things we had heard about, but hadn't seen the example. In other cases, uh, they, tr they told us about what they tried that didn't work in their jurisdiction and how they made corrections and what worked instead. Uh, and they were quizzed 
by, a, by a, a very sophisticated audience, really, about those tools. And so that was part of the research phase. Anita Morrison and Abby Ferretti helped cr us create this book called the Columbia Pike Land Use and Housing Study Preliminary Analysis Report. And uh, if you don't think economics can be exciting, <laughs> you need a copy of this. And you can download one um, from the website. What that book uh, includes is an analysis of nine representative sites. Here's what we did. We gave the goals to the economists who are objective, cold-hearted, calculator-wearing <laughs> number crunchers, but they actually love the pike as much as we do. And we said, in the real business world with real dollars, how do you make these things happen? What if we redeveloped this site or we kept this site on, as it is? How would we make that feasible for a, a real owner or investor? Um, what would have to happen in here this location or that location in terms of one kind or another of public subsidy, whether federal low-income housing tax credits or historic preservation tax credits or participation in the affordable housing uh, fund that the county operates. Uh, and they came back with each of these sites uh, with a lot of revealing lessons. We've tried this week to incorporate them. You know, we took site by site and tried to draw it different ways it could turn out. Maybe you add just a little bit, or maybe you tear down just a little bit, keep the rest, and add in the space that was freed up. Or maybe the site was redeveloped in wholesale and a lot more housing was delivered, and obviously the law of supply and demand means you don't get more affordable housing without having more housing, okay? Because scarcity drives prices up. And then Anita and Abby analyzed each of these for the cost of construction and the construction type and the parking expense. And they actually did a very detailed model and came back with an answer for each one about whether it would be really hard to achieve or easy, whether it would be requiring a high amount of public subsidy to come back at the end with the same number of affordable units as exists today on that spot, or it would require medium or a lower uh, amount of subsidy to achieve the same thing. Uh, and then the, the tools that we talked about were actually put into a big list, a matrix, several pages long, one by one, described their advantages, disadvantages, uh, what we think the challenges with them might be, and so on. And you can read, all, read through all of this. This is the list of tools that that county um, research is studying now. So doing all that got us all the way to this week. This week we had a kickoff presentation and then we had a hands-on session, an open design studio, uh, we had a, a parks and open spaces meeting, um, and tonight work in progress. Now while those were all going on, members of the planning team were out there checking things on site. This is the kind of work that we like to do on location in the town, uh, talking to people and looking at the place and taking photographs ourselves, not sitting at our desks in the office. And so uh, here you see Joe and Andrew and others walking up and down. We had a, probably an excessive amount, but relatively speaking to the whole week, a small amount of boring lectures by pointy-headed planning nerds um, <laughs> with their tendency to think they're God. Oh wait, look at the halo. How'd that happen? That's a quirk of photography, I promise. No playing God in this team. But, the, but really what that was all meant to do is provoke conversation. And so we, you know, we did do an open microphone session, had an open house on Tuesday night, which dozens of people attended. And we, and we asked people to, in just a few words, write down what's important to them. A few years from now, I would hope to see the following within the, the Pike neighborhoods. Someone wrote a continuous grid of parallel streets. Question, one idea that the planning team should explore this week, and the answer was green space and parks or wide sidewalks, outdoor dining. Here's a tricky one. What places have you visited that have an image, character, or sense of place that could be a model for future development in the Pike neighborhoods? This person said Seattle, which was interesting. So, um, of course, every time we ask a question, we get back affordable housing in a lot of the answers. We, we hear that. 
Now on Saturday morning, we had the hands-on session, which involved breaking a large group of people into small groups. Um, and they worked around the map for several hours with, a, with three different exercises. One of them was to take this poster, which has over on the left side some mixed-use buildings, kind of the main street sorts of buildings. In the center of the, the poster, some examples of larger-scale multifamily buildings. And on the right side, uh, some smaller-scale multifamily buildings and attached single-family, AKA row house or townhouse type um, structures. And we asked them to comment on what it was about that image that would make them either want to say it deserved a green dot for yes or a red dot for no. We gave each person a few sticker dots to put down on the, on the paper. But the purpose of this wasn't really to vote on them, but instead to start uh, you talking with one another about what you saw. And so people took pencils and wrote in the margins, or they circled something they liked about a picture. Um, in some cases, we'd get a picture back, and they'd circle part of it that they liked and part of it that they didn't like. That one happened on that one a lot. And so these were informing us, basically getting you thinking visually. You want to see some of the results of that? Uh, it, was, it was interesting. Now, some of this is about architecture and style and relationship of buildings to streets and public spaces. Some of it was about urbanism or urban design. Um, I don't think this one requires a lot of explanation, but it's one of the more, we got a lot, we got more than 40 sticker dots saying the one on the right was a red, don't do that on Columbia Pike. Um, here's an example with some um, denser housing, lots of positives on the one on the left negatives on the one on the right. And then we would ask questions, and people would say, well, I like the trees on the one on the right, or I like the architectural style on the one on the left. I like um, that kind of thing. And they were, they were rarely unanimous. We often got um, a, you know, a, few, a sprinkle of reds among a lot of greens, or vice versa. But in almost every case, we could see in the, in the pictures uh, a kind of reinforcing of the idea that if the building has a good relationship to the street or sidewalk, they like that scene more. And um, a good relationship is often the absence of blank walls or doors and windows facing the street or storefronts facing the street. Um, there was, um, and some of them invited commentary about modern architecture versus traditional architecture, but that was really kind of a sidebar conversation. It was more about building to street relations. Uh, things that were ten tended to be upright got a lot of green, and things that tended to be low slung and laying down tended to get a lot of red, which is kind of matches your way of rating a place as a pedestrian or a cyclist or a dog walker or uh, uh, an address seeker. Now next, what we did, we, we took the, um, the big map and we asked people to identify uh, character areas uh, within these uh, larger pieces of geography and describe how they might be different one from another. How is a piece that's closer to the pike or closer to the Sheraton um, or closer to a park or what have you different from the other pieces around the block? And we marked the maps together. We zoomed in close in some of the, the sub areas, central, west, east, Foxcroft Heights, um, and a couple of tables each. I think a total of 14, is that right? 14? table groups, which is phenomenal, um, each worked marking up the map, likes and dislikes and concerns and proposals and what have you. And then um, we gave them cutouts of things from the, the study and let them move them around on the map or see what they wanted to include or not include from that, or modify, as you see there. Um, here's an interesting one. That we'll be looking at again in a second down at Magnolia Commons, where a big parking lot right there uh, became the subject of some more detailed drawing we did later in the week. Now, when you zoom in on these maps, you find all kinds of little hidden gems in there. So we took the poster size marked up maps and we put them around the room uh, in the studio over at Siena Park for all of the week. So as the designers were working, trying to make one plan out of many, all of your drawings and sketches and diagrams and lists and diatribes and so on were on display um, right there where we could go back and refer to them. In some cases, we came back to you and asked the question, what did you mean by that, and, and got some clarification as we go. Give you some of the 
kinds of things we found out. We, we found out that you're really good planners. So you got the terminology down. We found out your spelling varies. Your, your spellers, you vary. But we found out both of those things. Now, um, and sometimes we would get something pretty detailed. You know, this intersection needs a trail connection. And sometimes we would get something rather generic, like redevelop here, and then later added a question mark. Not sure. Do, can you show us how it would be if we did redevelop there? And so we have not been bashful about filling in the blanks, where we didn't get a lot of detail. So we have things to show you that we know we're probably not quite right to say, is this what you meant on those? There's that sketch closer up that had the Magnolia Commons uh, on there. At the end of, of several hours of work, we had each table group make a presentation to all the others and tried to use the video camera to zoom in closer on the little maps so that people who were insisting on sitting at the back of the room could still see uh, what we were doing. And we took notes as that went on. Um, we collected all of the speakers' um, own talking notes. Uh, one of the things we did was make a list as we went. Justin, who has furiously fast typing fingers, was making a list as the speakers were presenting things. And every time someone would repeat an idea that he'd already heard, he put it closer to the top of the list and built a long list of good things. Uh, can you read them all here? Variety of green spaces or uh, diversity of affordable housing, streetscapes, stepping down the scale, that kind of thing. And uh, so we put those in a list. And at the end of the 14 groups presentations, we used the keypads and, uh, and found out, out of all those good things, because we know you want all of them, which ones rise to the top of your priority list? We said you could choose three. And the ones that came out on top, let's say the top four here, preserve diversity of, of housing is at the top. Uh, then improve the pedestrian experience is right up there. And then for a tie for a third is a variety of open and green spaces and uh, promoting architectural quality and continuity. At the end of that meeting, we gave everybody a worksheet like this one with a few simple questions like, of the many ideas you heard today, which ones seem most exciting to you? And the responses were pretty interesting. First, people who wrote in really big, bold, capped letters, uh, we knew they, they were serious about it. So we got this one a lot in capital letters. Uh, we got this one a lot, uh, more green space. Or here's another person, integrated, coordinated, additional green space. More detail on that one. Here's a person who made a list, then marked it out, then changed their mind. <laughs> which was, so we, this was an ongoing and iterative back and forth process. Uh, we got a variety of opinions. Here's one that said, the answer for Foxcroft Heights, high density, 10 stories. And then we got the next one in the stack said, keep Foxcroft Heights as it is. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> We had to tell you that that happened, because otherwise you might wonder why we scratched our heads for a few extra hours thinking about Foxcroft Heights. Um, but there, uh, and so if you, if you go through this inch tall stack of survey responses and you see what people wrote in their own handwriting, you begin to see recurring themes. Um, one of them that seems pretty darn important, uh, which was on the, on the list, is the idea of making walkable streets. And we, we realize that walkability is used in your handwriting here as a kind of proxy for a lot of other things, an indicator of livability in all regards. Walkability probably also means bicycle friendliness and transit worthiness and other quality of life things. If you, walkability implies there's somewhere to walk to. So we, we read into that, that you would like to have a sidewalk cafe, or we read into that that you'd like to have neighbors you could get to know and walk there. Or the dog park that many of you mentioned uh, needs a way to get there with your dog without having to drive to it and park to go to the dog park. We got one more piece of input which is important. The facilitator for table six was fantabulous. <laughs> and I've, I need to go back and find out who that was, but they, uh, they were obviously popular. Now, the design team worked uh, late into the night every night since over in Siena Park in an ad hoc design studio, drawing things and arguing with each other, tearing things up. Uh, uh, we had visitors of all ages and from all walks of life. And then they would go out on away missions. So Ian, for example, and his young friend there uh, were walking the streets in Foxcroft Heights talking together about traffic calming, that kind of thing. There was 
uh, design fun, yes, but there was also a, a pretty non-frivolous and rigorous analysis going on. Uh, Joseph Cole took this little map, for example, the western end, and took all of the parcels within our study area. And it, that, you know, there are outline and beyond the parcels that are part of the revitalization district nodes. And he, um, let me just back that up. And so what he did was he actually said, okay, these are condominiums, and these are fee simple houses or row houses, and these are garden apartments, and these are single buildings. And of the garden apartments, here are the small ones, the medium ones, and the large ones. And for each of those, he ranked them into categories and went back through the thick book and tested the strategies. Was what the economists thought was, was most feasible actually workable on the land? in the topography or with the street connections that needed to be made for transportation reason or with the streetcar stop location and what have you. So that's basically what's happened all up and down the pike over the last several days. Probably or wondering when you look at the maps whether that means we're preordaining exactly one solution for each of the parcels and we're not. So if you're the owner of one of them, don't think that's what this means. I mean, the purpose of this study is to create a hypothetical scenario we can analyze for its implications on things like school classroom overcrowding or things like affordable housing results or transportation needs or parks and open space requirements. Okay? It is a scenario for study. It's not a regulation. You understand? Okay. Uh, we On Monday night, Dave Barth, a uh, guru of... Um, Parks and Open Space Planning uh, held a meeting to uh, discuss open space. And we got people filling in uh, priority needs. It's people who were choosing between things like hiking and biking trails or dog park or uh, a, a small green or a tot lot or uh, ecological restoration projects or what have you um, and giving feedback to that. That surveying will continue as we go through more meetings. Ian went out there with his little measuring wheel to see how wide things were, curb to curb. He's always smiling like that. And there's part of the Foxcroft Heights uh, walking tour, which, of course, starts as an urban designer to point out things he can't help noticing and becomes a, a tour given by the neighbors that the urban designer listens to. So that was good. Um, the open house on Tuesday night. How many of you, just quickly, uh, show of hands, attended that? Okay. Good many people walked through. There was no formal presentation, but we had a lot of stuff on the walls for people to see this work in progress. No fist fights broke out, but it, there was some energetic conversation. We appreciate that. Let's get a quick uh, poll from you with the keypad polling devices. You might, if you're sitting next to an empty chair, you might look and see if, the, if there's a keypad sitting next to you if you don't have one already. And the last number you choose will be the one that is your vote. Uh, we'll do a little countdown, presumably. Um, and then the result will come up. So first, a fun, uh, non-binding answer. <laughs> what is your age? Survey's open. Five seconds remain. And the result is interesting. Two biggest groups in here tonight are between 30 and 50, uh, followed by the 50 to 60-year-olds and the 60 to 70-year-olds, and then a little sprinkle above and below. Okay, now you see how the keypads work? All right, let's do the next one. Uh, now some of you, not all of you, live or work or have lived or worked in the Columbia Pike area. So we just want an answer now from those to whom that's applicable. Okay, so if you're from somewhere else, don't answer. Uh, but if you live or work or both, or you have lived or worked or both in the Columbia Pike area, tell us how long. Five seconds left. More than 20 years is the biggest group. Wow, tremendous. Okay, but it is, it is telling also that we have a quarter of you who are here for less than five years. So that means we're getting people that are new to the neighborhood coming out and joining in and integrating in your civic process. And that's great news. Okay, next. Now we had a series of events I, I reminded you about. Let's find out what you attended. You can choose multiple events. 
no events, that's five or six, or you can pick just one of the ones above. Okay, so about half of you came to more than one thing, uh, which is tremendous. Great, oh, we'll go faster then. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Now I mentioned to you that the plenary group and the working group had hammered out these goals. And I'm not gonna read them all to you. There's a, there's a, a booklet of objectives under each one of them. And at several of the previous meetings, we've, we've let you read the exact wording of each of the goals. But we've, we've simplified and paraphrased them into headlines here. So here are the what if questions. Can you achieve the goal of a healthy, diverse community with a high quality of life? Can you achieve the goal of strengthening neighborhoods, even while you understand growth and change is going on, and support those mixed-use centers with the surrounding neighborhood population? So they don't have to be regional destinations to survive, but you're supporting them. The third goal has to do with housing, mixed income, mixed housing type, which means sizes, prices, and everything else, and preserving affordability. If there are 6,000 uh, affordable units now, or 5,000 market affordable units, could you grow by 10,000 and still have 5,000 left? I think you probably can, but, uh, but it is an ambitious goal, a very ambitious goal. Now, before we go any farther about affordable housing, because I've used the phrase a couple of times tonight, it's worth pausing to give you a definition. For the purposes of this study, and affordable housing advocates know that there's always a rigorous debate anytime you bring up the term uh, about what it means in exactly one place and so on, and there are multiple definitions. But for this purposes, the standard is that an affordable dwelling unit is one that can, uh, requires no more uh, in, uh, from, from the uh, occupant than 30% of their income. So what you're looking for here is if 60% if of the people, right, 60% of the median area in income, take the income of the area and you say 60% of that, if the person who makes 60% of the area median income, which in this case is $62,000 for a household, of four, or $52,000, I think, for a household of two, then they can afford the house or the apartment, okay? So in terms of rentals, what that translates into uh, is about $1,500, $1,300, okay, $1,300 for a family of four, $1,100 for a family of two, household of two. And in terms of home ownership, there's, it's defined differently. Um, in, the, in their case, it's a unit that a dwelling for which the price is no more than about 317, I think in the current, $317,000. Those sound like big numbers, right? But that's what the, uh, somebody who's spending 30% of their income, who makes 60% of area median income would spend, or less, would spend that or less, and it would be considered an affordable unit. Okay, so that's where we come up with this number of what they are. And, and so when we, Use the shorthand. I wanted you to get an idea what that was. Um, now, the, you talked a lot about walk in the in the goals about the same thing we saw in the handouts: walkable, walkable streets, multimodal streets to support cycling and, and so on. And you know, we, we visualize a Pike future. You know, that includes going from what you have to a place that's greater than that in in this way. So, making great streets and public spaces. On the on the other hand. Uh, preserving things that are important. Uh, you can see in the back in the background on this picture the arches of the Barcroft apartment garden apartment um, scene. So preservation, uh, historic preservation is another goal, but it doesn't just mean buildings; it also means preservation of tree canopy and neighborhood character. Okay. Another one of the goals says we want the Pike to be big, be really successful but we also want there to be good transitions between uh, the, um, the development on the pike and the sensitive residential areas that surround it. 
And so, for example, here in a sketch that was done for the Westmont area, the existing single family houses and existing row houses that are uh, south of the pike there, not uh, that are behind the Westmont development, uh, could be faced by a smart project that included development close to them that is of a similar scale to the existing development, but has another layer closer to the pike that is denser and more uh, elaborate. So those transitions are important. The seventh goal um, is about a green building and sustainable um, development practices. So it's about taking care of the, the water quality and quantity. It's about being wise with energy and materials and so on. And you might wonder, we, we, we just talked about preservation, and, and I'll tell you, it's very clear. The greenest building is the one that already exists that the materials don't go to the landfill to make room for something else. So your historic preservation goal and your green building goals go together. The greenest building is the one that's in a place where there's transit, so that not every daily move requires uh, using a personal uh, automobile to go about your daily life. That's greener too. So the location matters, the, whether it, the building already exists matters. How dense matters because as we use land close in, we preserve land farther out. So green and, uh, and historic preservation go together. They also go together with this uh, thing you kept bringing up about green space, open space, public space, parks. Because those provide opportunities to do smarter things with your rainwater as it lands on Columbia Pike or, um, or, or your uh, habitat restoration and your steep slopes and so on. We do a lot of visualizations this week about taking places that you know that are full of asphalt and turning them into the places you might like better that are much greener. And we'll look at this again in a minute. All that stuff has been now boiled into a map that might look, because it's up on a computer screen and all that stuff, like it's done, but it's not. It's a draft. Please, everyone, repeat after me. Draft. draft. Okay. This is called the illustrative plan. And you remember the shown here in kind of a gray or the illustrative plan drawings from nine years ago of the revitalization district nodes. And then now, this week, we've added on around them illustrative plans for the rest of those study areas. That's the first crack based on the hypothetical scenario that we talked about. I'm going to zoom in on this map and take you on a real quick tour um, of some special places in that and bring up issues as we go that have come up like uh, the street standards or traffic calming or what about retail and so on. Now, in the background of this is a, very well, is a pretty well understood pattern of neighborhoods uh, and, and defined a couple of different ways. Defined by the uh, five minutes walking distance from center to edge that urban designers always use as a shorthand for the way you build the city in a cellular way out of neighborhoods. And then in the, by the definitions you use with your civic associations, which are larger areas, not uncommon in suburbia. So we'll be looking in closer at each of these, starting on the west and working our way to the east. If we zoom in on the western sub-area, uh, this is where we start to see places like um, uh, the, the pike here. Okay. Um, and it's um, actually, if you, if you look closely, this is the beginning of Magnolia Commons, but new buildings have been inserted. And I'm going to zoom in on this. And then old buildings have been preserved, and then some new buildings have been inserted, and then old buildings preserved again. So there's, this map has the darker color uh, for new buildings and the lighter color for existing buildings. Uh, but while that was going on, we were also looking at bigger systems, like the street pattern. So you'll remember there's an, uh, an important goal to create parallel paths, um, paralleling the pike, for, in particular for cyclists to have more options, um, to improve the pedestrian connections, and to allow for some ease of circulation. As the pike gets a streetcar or the pike grows busier over time, those alternative connections will be important. And so here's a map of the existing streets and trails. And here you see uh, inserted in it in red or green, uh, a series of interventions. Sometimes it's just a bike and pedestrian connection that doesn't exist today, but could. Sometimes it's a new street that could be created when that parking lot gets redeveloped as a building site. 
aware of the park. Um, and you know, the, these will all be on the web, and you can look at them more closely. We can zoom in on them later in the meeting as well. Now, that required us to confront uh, an important manual that the county worked on for years in its transportation element, the street standards. And so we've devised a series of street types uh, based on the county standards, compliant with the county standards. They do things like you know, introduce uh, a narrowing, an optical narrowing of, of the street. Um, it sometimes creates a place for a street tree, but most importantly creates a sense when you're driving that that's not a place where you should speed. And that's something that occurs uh, in the county standards. This particular example has the width between those little bump outs uh, set where the county standard requires them to be, 20 feet clear. And Ian is going to zoom in on this and show you variations later in the meeting. But I wanted you to understand that while we're looking at things like affordable housing, we're also going back and forth with your transportation department or your parks department and what have you to study these same things. Let's look at Magnolia Commons. Here's that what if. And you can see the, some of the campus style buildings of the uh, old affordable housing complex still existing. Today there's a, 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 a road that comes up this way, comes through two long wide parking lots uh, with buildings on either side. And then the one everybody knows when they think of Magnolia Commons is the one at the end uh, with the, um, the, the double veranda porch at the end of it here. So this is existing conditions. And we w tried to wait for a sunny day, but we were running out of time. <laughs> so we just took the picture. Um, and it was, a, it was a tool for a really useful dialogue with your historic preservation officials and neighbors from that end. Because we asked Steve Price to put this into his computer. And in that conversation, we brought up things we couldn't help noticing, like the difference in quality from one part of the campus to another. So even though, as a whole, it's part of a historic resources inventory, someone's drawn a line around it and said, that one could be important. For, uh, some of it is more important than others, right? Like probably the preservationist, even the most ardent preservationist, will not weep over that asphalt plain uh, that's in the foreground of this picture. One would hope. So here's a what if. Um, in, this, in this scenario, the parking's been reconfigured, not eliminated. And the stage has been set through an improvement of the public spaces between buildings for the buildings that face those addresses to be replaced and improved in some cases over time also. So here are the Terra building, as they like to call it, at the end of the street, even though it doesn't look that much like Terra, but they say that anyway. Um, it's still there and it's still focal, but it's actually honored a lot more in that long vista uh, by the creation of a small linear park uh, in what used to be the parking lot. And then facing it is a combination of the existing buildings preserved and new buildings added. And, and this sketch shows um, a small number of row houses, which could be, which could break down the kind of monolithic nature of some of these garden apartment buildings, which have only apartments in them. And then apartment buildings, right there with them, so you're getting to that diversity that people asked for, as well as making the numbers work. What if? After, before. You want to see that one more time? Okay, so we couldn't help wondering. We're going to get you to respond to those pictures. So I'll give you a chance to, to respond to both of them. We want you first to tell us, to rate for us, the existing conditions. If you don't have a keypad, you can get one from Joe. So now you're not, you're not judging the transformation, the imagined urban design idea I showed you, just the existing conditions picture. And what we really are listening for is, as it is, is it the model? for the future of the pike? Um, is it good enough as you see it in the picture? So how do you rate this scene as shown here? You can choose one for you not liking it very much, so that's not good enough, or five for you love it, and the middle would be no real opinion. OK. This was a test. You passed. Let's, Let's try the more controversial one. Ready? Now this is the after picture, the what if that Steve created. Five for you love it, one for it's not good enough, or you hate it, whichever you prefer. 
and the survey says, okay, if you had to choose, you probably would choose this one. <laughs> okay. All right. Is that it for that? Okay. Now, when we do things like illustrate parking going away so that you can make a new building site or make a, uh, make a, make a little park out of what used to be the asphalt in the parking lot, you immediately wonder, yeah, but parking is still important. What about all the parking? And as the pike densifies, uh, parking will change. Parking will gradually transform, I predict, in this place from being a private matter on a private lot with competition for spaces into, in many cases, especially in the nodes, being a matter of public infrastructure or public-private combinations, like those 150 new public spaces that you have uh, down at, uh, at Penrose Square. But what, so what you have to imagine is that what today is handled in a surface lot might in the future be handled a different way. In some cases, could be handled as on-street parking spaces on one of your new walkable streets. They are, after all, linear parking lots. And those spaces count. And then on top of that, sometimes the site will lend itself to putting the parking under, but not very often because that's really expensive. And other times, it, the, the site will lend itself to building an efficient parking structure and then doing everything you can to wrap it and screen it and conceal it as seen from your public spaces. And so James's little diagram here shows, for example, this apartment building tucking its, some of its the parking it demands uh, in the middle of the block, not hanging out on your street, but lined by, by other buildings that have habitable space and for which the rooftop is captured as an opportunity, like uh, a place for your pool or garden or a place for your photovoltaic cells that are generating electricity. So that's moving basically from surface lots and buildings, or as is all too common, buildings poking out of parking lots to parking structures. This is a normal, natural progression of where you are. Now, there are sites also that lend themselves to just one le level of parking under the building because it's a sloping site or it's easily excavated. And that's a lot less complicated than a multi-story uh, deep excavated deck down below the big building. So those are some of the ways that parking can be hidden from view and still be there. So you're not going to lose all your parking just to get what you want. Let's move in on the central part of the pike. This includes Barcroft, uh, the intersection of George Mason and, um, and the pike. Here's um, Four Mile Run and Four Mile Run Drive, and here's Westmont, which I talked about a little bit before. And remember, this is kind of crucial in the pattern of the streetcar because the stops for the streetcar at these nodes are already anticipated in the form-based code and the previous plans. And some places, like that one, in the corner of Barcroft are an obvious missing piece in the puzzle of um, a main and main intersection. Okay, so the attitude that this uh, sketch took was that most of Barcroft is pretty darn important and good and could be kept uh, over a long period of time, if, uh, assuming the owners are excited about that idea. Um, it's a historic preservation high objective to do that. But some of Barcroft could be redeveloped just gently and on the edges to make a better pike and make a better intersection of Main and Main at the, at the uh, village center and the town centers. So when we zoom in on Barcroft here, you see a couple of interesting things. One is the idea that where right now uh, there are just ordinary intersections, there's actually space to do something like a real square. And that the patterns that exist in memory, like these uh, these kind of streets that are the, the original entrance to Barcroft can be maintained as patterns on the land, lines in the land, even as the place grows and changes. Uh, what started in the, uh, the denser, busier, more bustling intersection uh, can be met with more durable buildings uh, that are designed to be up against the bustle and also deliver more units. So anytime we add uh, to the total number of dwellings, assuming that we do so with efficient economical building types, we are producing the, an ability for some of the income realized that way to be devoted to preserving the rest for historic preservation reasons or affordable housing conservation reasons. So this is what you see here. It's basically a scenario where part of it gets developed and makes a business case for keeping the rest of it unchanged. 
except for you know improving public spaces and streets, that kind of thing. So uh, here's a sketch done at the familiar spot where you know the arches at, at Barcroft, um, and this is right at the joint where part of the revitalization district node is on one side of this picture over here, uh, and and the in between area is on the other side. And so James did a little sketch. What if you know, that becomes a real street-like street? And here's a new building that might be taller than the existing one, as you saw in the plan. And it's allowed to have a storefront now because it's included in the main street kind of environment. Uh, here's the buildings on the other side are transitioning down to the lower scale. And then behind, the existing historic structures are maintained and the walks are similar to the ones that exist and so on. What if? Let's move up the pike just a little bit to Westmont. Um, what you see here is a building type we think will end up being a popular part of the menu for future buildings along the pike because it's capable of delivering enough units um, to be um, uh, reasonable as a business proposition and even enough to deliver enough income that matched up with all of those things like the low-income housing tax credits and so on, you could deliver affordable housing with the mix. And at the same time, uh, it can be built without doing really tall buildings. So uh, James, are you still in the room? How tall are the buildings uh, on this sketch for Westmont? Closest to the pike, how tall is the tallest building on this picture? Five stories. So what that means is that the, it can be built at a reasonable construction cost because when we jump up taller than that, start instead of building with wood construction, you start building with concrete frames or even taller with steel frames and skyscrapers, and the cost of construction escalates really fast. So we think this will be, end up being a, a, a frequently occurring building type, a courtyard building. And then what he did after reworking the street grid here is he imagined a layer of row houses and similarly scaled buildings uh, that would meet with the layer of existing row houses on the south side of the street. So here's Quincy, here's Columbia Pike. And what, what's happening now is that those five-story buildings are transitioning down to four and three-story buildings that can be next to the two and three-story houses. And this is the sketch that illustrates that. Columbia Pike at the top with the tallest buildings, and here's the existing neighbors, and the transitional layer that's built in. Um, urban designers know to do this instinctively, but the transitions in this case are one of your stated goals from the working group. And the bonus that comes with things like this, when you get efficient with the building types, is you get space to make public space. So a neighborhood that doesn't have a, a, a little square or a gathering place now, where you could throw the Frisbee or have a potluck picnic, gets one in the process of redevelopment. I guess the idea is that if you're going to see redevelopment occur someday, and we're not trying to accelerate it, that you want to make sure it's a trade up, not a trade down, in terms of the sense of place or the quality of the space. So now this is um, close by there on the corridor, uh, where now we're looking west. Westmont is to our left. This is Columbia Pike. And you might remember this is one of the places where just down the road, Alcova Row, the row houses were built where they excavated into the hill and used an alley so that the fronts of the houses could face the pike. Um, that's just down that way. And some of the buildings that are across the street right in this section, on the other hand, weren't done that way. And so the backs of the units face the pike, and it's a little unfortunate. But um, what if? Well, the first thing's first. In a relatively simple way, working within the, the, the right of way that already exists, uh, the pike will be rebuilt or adjusted here and there uh, and, in, and the streetcar installed. And so we anticipate that that's going to happen. Uh, so far, so good. Can you see that again? Existing, <laughs> likely future. But then once the development occurs next to a site like this, you get the opportunity for a big part of the upgrade, like, for example, a wide tree lawn with pairs of trees that form an alley along the sidewalk. So you can walk uh, along a wide sidewalk under uh, paired rows of trees. And so in this sketch, um, 
that Steve did. Here are the new buildings that uh, were in the plan I asked James about. Uh, and they have their doors and windows and porches and so on facing the street. This is not part of the main street area of Columbia Pike. This is in between. So it's a little greener. The buildings are a little more set back. Um, there's room for a second row of trees. Steve Price, who the, the, made the image, makes his cameo appearance in that one. <laughs> like Alfred Hitchcock in his movies, right? Um, what if? Now, we also did this one a couple of different ways just to illustrate that all this is not final. Like you, for example, could decide uh, to define the dooryards differently and make them much more um, spatially distinct and varied in their plantings and so on. Or you could keep it simpler and have a tree lawn. And both of those are good. So it's not like you have to figure that out right now. Or you could leave it like that. Let's test this one. And we'll go faster in its time because you've, you've done this once already. We're rating now just the existing conditions, what's shown here. One for not good enough, five for you love it just the way it is. And the survey says not good enough. But more mix on this one than the last time. You're beginning to figure this out. okay? Because <laughs> there is a lot to love about the existing picture. We know that. Okay, now let's rate Steve's simulation. First crack at it. Now it's got the streetcar and the tree lawn and the new buildings. Okay, there's the result. Um, looks like an upgrade. Now we'll move over to the eastern side. <clears throat> there are a number of sites that, that uh, are in this eastern side that have their own complex history and story. I'm not going to zoom in on each one of them, but we haven't forgotten about them. For example, Fillmore Garden, as shown here, um, is illustrated much as is, because that one rises to the very top of the list of historic preservation priorities. So one hopes that the much beloved Fillmore Gardens will uh, prove feasible to preserve, and uh, we, sent, we share the, the uh, sense that it would be good to have that happen. Uh, we also illustrated in other sites, um, like at uh, Dorchester uh, Apartments and, and Dorchester Towers, that change, or in some cases very subtle, gentle change, in others more just dramatic change, would be good, worthwhile and worth uh, investigating. So we're going to look at that, and then we'll also look at Foxcroft Heights. Zoom in here a little bit. Uh, some sites like Dorchester Towers lend themselves to very subtle, small additions, if any. There's a northern end uh, on Dorchester Towers, which we think uh, some of the underutilized land there could be captured someday for a parking structure, would release part of the site for some additional units, some affordable. So that's, a, that's the example of the small is beautiful kind of change. And then south of there, here's the pike. Uh, in the area around uh, Dominion Plaza and Dominion Towers, here's Dorchester Apartments. Uh, we illustrated a more dramatic change, just so you had a picture of what wholesale redevelopment could, could yield. And so there are a couple of stories to tell you about this. One, uh, if you look closely at this map, you'll see that there are strategic small things added here and there at the base of the big buildings. We recognize that it's probably not economically attractive or likely that the big buildings uh, will be torn down and replaced in anytime soon. Uh, they're likely to remain. But at, unfortunately, they don't all have the best relationship of building to street. They don't form good street spaces and make walkability, as you said, you wanted that. And sometimes what could have been a, a street connection or a bike path or a public space was just done as a leftover fragment of yard or um, an inaccessible slope or a parking lot, and we saw opportunities for adjusting those. How could we reframe entrances, for example? Look how small that little addition or that little addition or that little addition are relative to the existing buildings. And the story I see here is that small things can make a very big difference. 
in the end, the future could include big things like the tallest buildings that would ever be there, the existing buildings uh, at Dominion Plaza and Dominion Towers. And, and so big things and small things like uh, row houses and historic buildings and um, the, that can exist. And medium-sized things like the practical scale for new development can all be intermingled in a scene like that. Um, one, <laughs> One of the people who walked through the studio the other day saw this as a, as a black and white sketch before Andrew Georgiatis colored it up and he said, is that Helsinki? Is that Stockholm? And uh, actually to urban designers, it's a pretty big compliment. But remember back on the map you gave us on Saturday, it just said redevelop here. And we didn't get to this level of detail. So here's a first crack at it as a sketch. Um, this is the square you just saw right there. And the buildings you saw framing it were the new development there and the existing towers with little additions in the foreground. And the streets you saw are just opportunity streets that can be made to frame and connect with working with what already exists. And we're going to zoom in in a moment on that spot right there. I want to say a lot more about that picture, but I'll come back to it later. The, now here's getting down on the ground is where you really find out how these things work because you stand there with your camera and you're forced to confront through the lens all that exists, whether it's you know overhead wires or or uh, an incomplete um, edge to the street or um, you know the more asphalt than you really want that kind of thing. Um, you begin to really realize what's going on, and one of the things that happens is that. The decision a long, long time ago to put X-shaped and T-shaped and Korean alphabet-shaped buildings on the, on the land resulted in a lot of lost space. Uh, like the big area here, triangular uh, parking lot and, uh, and somewhat random green space, this guy standing here contemplating Dominion Towers, isn't actually contributing very much. You know, the building is tall and it's set back, but there's not a sense of high-quality public spaces in neighborhood uh, right there. Not anybody's fault, it's just it was designed as an X on a, on a map and not three-dimensionally like, like in urbanism or in, in architecture. So we, let's just look together at scale. You see this fellow back here? We highlighted him in yellow, walking across the street. He's more or less in the plane of the doorway of the building back there in the distance. And it takes a lot of him stacked one on top of another to reach the height of that building. Uh, so when you're looking at the photograph, that corner of Dominion uh, Tower is actually set, or Dominion Plaza, sorry, is set pretty far back. And just for comparison, uh, our friend here in the foreground is a lot closer to us. See how much bigger he is? And what this, the magic of perspective is that small things can do a lot to change the character of a place. They don't have to be really tall to totally change your experience on the street for the better. What if? There's one of those little additions in the corner that you saw in the plan, the little gold or ochre color uh, drawings with our friend, the man in yellow, standing there in front of it. And <coughs> what that's done is created a new entrance to Dominion Plaza that's a street-oriented entrance. And it hasn't hidden the building necessarily. It's still looming back there. But it's created a relationship from the complex to the street. And it's framing public space with architecture, which is usually positive. And it don't, doesn't take very many of him, uh, height-wise, to achieve that result. You know, but things like that get added as residential complexes mature and grow. You, they need a new fitness center or they need a new amenity or they want to add a different kind of unit their existing building doesn't have, maybe has different kind of bedrooms or what have you. And those leftover spaces around the alphabet letter shaped building um, are spaces where that could be done if the owner so chose uh, in the future. So what if? We think as that idea caught on, you'd begin to gradually build a traditional neighborhood out of the buildings poking out of parking lots pattern. And there's the existing conditions. 
Oh, Jeffrey. You should use the podium mic. Um, in all this talk about building your way out of problems and adding buildings comes the inevitable question, how do you get the architecture to be good enough? Because in some cases, people look around at the newest buildings built, whether they're done here or at Potomac Yards or somewhere, and they say, really? That's as good as it can get? How can we get this? How can we tighten this up? How can we make this turn out better? So Jeff, answer that question. And so Victor. I don't know what he's going to say, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Because he didn't know he was going to be speaking. Um, the answer is part of an architectural code. First thing, because I think a lot of us know that there is, as part of the form-based code for the centers, an architectural code, a set of standards that covers the materials and the proportions of what can be built. And we've got certain results from that now. And it's certainly, uh, I think I would say, and a lot of people would agree, some might disagree, that we've gotten really pretty good results from it, but, but understand for the in-between areas we're talking about, we would be talking about, I would I have to assume, wanting different results. We're not talking about a applying the same set of rules that got us the Halstead and Siena Park for the in-between areas, it's a, when we come up with that vision, we have to come up with a different set of standards. And also, uh, besides being different, it's updated. You are all more experienced with this now, we're more experienced with this now, and we'll have a new vision. So we need to work together to come up with what we want those buildings to be made out of and what kind of character we want them to have. But the vision comes first. You skipped the part about hire better architects. But that's also part of the answer. Nurturing your town building culture so that the design results go up and becoming a place where architects want to get a commission because in the future, Columbia Pike is the place to, have your, to show your best work. Uh, that's definitely part of it as well. Now let's, let's zoom in closer on uh, the east side to Foxcroft Heights quickly. Uh, here's the existing conditions and most of you know uh, we're in the Sheraton in that room right there. The Navy Annex is going to be demolished. Um, here's the Air Force Memorial. Southgate Road is going to be closed and the cemetery will expand uh, into this area. And so with that set of changes, plus the arrival of the streetcar and even the potential for straightening out uh, the curve in Columbia Pike, uh, come all sorts of new opportunities for Foxcroft Heights, but also new uncertainties and, and worries. So, We've zoomed in and spent extra time on Foxcroft Heights for this reason. The folks in Foxcroft Heights were also very patient because they needed a plan in 2002 and they were told, hold on, we'll get back to this. And so here we are. Now, uh, before the charrette uh, began, we created this diagram to uh, really float as a trial balloon with the neighbors from Foxcroft Heights to see if we had been hearing them right. And one of the things that this asks is, are we right? that because of the Sheraton and because of the commercial nature of the properties on the pike, and because of the impact right out in front um, on that adjacent part of Orm Street, that this frontage on the pike and, and that piece of Orm that is in fronted by the Sheraton are different. And the, on the other hand, back here where the, the Oak Street and Ode Street uh, houses and row houses are, uh, the tranquil, uh, beloved neighborhood that it is, that's different again and needs its own set of priorities. And there's the section of Orm Street here between the base and the Sheraton that's different yet again. And so here's a, like three flavors of ice cream, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. Uh, an idea of thinking of Foxcroft Heights, not as monolithic, but as a variety of pieces that could be regulated different ways in the future. And so we've done a depiction in the draft map uh, that's uh, being mounted for display at, after the meeting uh, of how that might look, you know, someday when the buildings along the pike are built and redevelopment occurs on Orm Street, but preservation occurs on Ode and Oak. And um, so this is an attempt, just a first attempt, to illustrate both and instead of either or. Is it possible? What if everybody got something they want, but nobody got everything they want? 
because the people who are anxious to see redevelopment on Orm Street are able to redevelop, but not able to build the world's tallest building. And what if the people on Oak and Oak who were quite vocal with us about wanting to maintain the single family residential character got to do that and were encouraged to make upgrades, but not encouraged to, uh, to leave or feel encroached upon? That's the what if illustrated here. Now, we've been showing this angle for a while because we really, as urban designers, can't help noticing the unsightly bus parking lot uh, where the bus is idle next to people's houses. Uh, across the street. And what you need to know about that is that right now, the, the bus parking lot right there is just, uh, it's a unique selling feature for this hotel. If you're gonna bring the marching band from um, the um, university far away and, you want, and they want to all stay together, well here, they can have the buses right next to the building where they're staying. But as you'd probably know, that's really rare in greater Washington. Most of the time, the marching band from Purdue or wherever gets dropped off, and the buses go somewhere else and park, like uh, in an area where the real estate is not so valuable, for one thing, or in an area where idling next to other people isn't going to bother somebody. So the, this, the stadium parking lot and uh, the like become the logical places to store buses. So we, we look at this and realize, and, and you, you, you should be excited to know that there are new owners in the Sheraton, so there's a kind of a new, fresh conversation started there as well. They're in the hotel business, but they're also in the real estate business. And someday, there's going to be a streetcar right here. And someday, there might be even new regulations or improved, or improved uh, ideas of how to control development here. And they're going to want to take advantage of the expensive urban land that right now they just park buses on. Okay? And when that happens, what if? So this illustrates uh, not buildings that are as big as the ones that are at Adams uh, Penrose Square um, or uh, Siena Park or Halstead, but smaller, um, and able to wrap the corner so that you could get uh, buildings that are about the same depth and maybe a little closer to the street as the row houses, but are allowed to be a little taller than the row houses are. So you could recreate the relationship across the, from the front of the Sheraton. And this drawing even goes more ambitious. It says, you know, if, a, if the Sheraton owners got that savvy about their real estate, they'd realize that that embankment they have down at the base of the building next to the blank wall of the parking garage is also valuable urban land. And here's a sketch that shows that being put into use as well. Plus, the pike has changed to be a new tree-lined street um, with the streetcar. So what if? The big thing to think about here is that the transitions between these areas, the more neighborhood conservation type approach and the uh, encouragement of redevelopment, those transitions occur at the rear lot line, not down the middle of streets. So that like faces like, okay? What it doesn't contemplate is any new buildings anywhere near the height of the Sheraton. So right now we haven't calculated that in. And I'll tell you for two reasons. One is even if we had never met a single one of the neighbors who hate that idea, okay? We have met plenty of them. But even if we hadn't met them, we know the parking problem of the site is that the sites are only just so big and it will be immensely difficult, if not impossible, to excavate enough or build enough to build another building the size of this one on those sites. The geometry is just not there. On the other hand, can they be taller than the existing buildings? Yes. So this is the compromise we want you to sleep on. Here's the Orm Street. And if you take on that idea that Orm Street is different from Oat and Oak and should encourage redevelopment, and you take on the idea that the part that is faced by the Sheraton is different again, um, what if? Now, this is, these are buildings that have bays just like the row houses, but they could have a flexible kind of base so that you could do them as, you could do them as housing all the way down. Or if you had an idea that would allow you to do a simple, storefront, like a live-work unit, you could do that as well. That's what we're thinking right now. The economist will tell you in a heartbeat that running stores all the way and restaurants all the way down that side is not feasible, at least not today. And not, we're not encouraging that. But what you could do, on the other hand, is if, you, if you're the fancy lawyer with an office downtown on the top of a building in K Street, and you want to move home and leave the big law firm and have your small practice in an expanded home-based business, that's below your dwelling, that would be a pretty cool place to do it. Or if you're the piano teacher 
that wants to bring people around, from around the neighborhood over to your studio that's downstairs, a live work unit like that would be a cool place to do it. And that, you can see that in action in Carlisle, for example, in Old Town Alexandria. You can basically see live work combinations like that in Center City, Philadelphia, or any old traditional neighborhood. We've just gotten away from it. But meanwhile, it's also possible to use those same ground floor areas as dwelling space, uh, and that's natural as well. Um, so that's uh, illustrating a kind of convertible building type, what the Philadelphians used to call the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost type, usually three or more stories, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the ground floor capable of being one thing or another, depending on the times and the needs. Ian? Ian Lockwood, you need that microphone right there. My name is Ian Lockwood and... Got it, thank you. Can I borrow your lightsaber? Well, hello everybody. I'm Ian Lockwood, I'm a uh, transportation engineer and uh, I took the liberty of writing my entire speech out so I don't forget anything. Um, <laughs> it's on that little business card. That's all the time I gave him. Yeah, okay. Um, just a couple things. Which one do I press? On the right. The right, okay. Just a couple of things. Um, the big idea for transportation, besides the streetcar, are two parallel routes, um, 9th and 12th in the community. The, um, the idea is not to create a highway parallel to Columbia Pike, but a local route which allows locals to get um, around the community without necessarily having to use the pike, which frees up the pike for all sorts of other things. Um, the other cool part of that uh, 9th and 12th uh, parallel route is for people on bicycles to create a continuous link for cycling you know, to the parks and um, trails and so forth. So those are the, that's one of the big ideas. The, um, the other idea that you've seen in a lot of these drawings is a, a few more street connections. The, the network out there is pretty sparse, and so we've been looking for opportunities to make connections so that um, we can break up some of these big super blocks. They have to drive a long way around. And the cross-section of street, the, uh, the way the street looks, the heavy lifting of that will be done by that section that Victor showed you a little earlier, where you have, um, 20 feet, uh, 10, 10 foot lanes, one in each direction for um, traveling along, and then you've got seven foot on each side for parking, you know, with the street trees in that parking row. So that's the street section that will do the heavy lifting in uh, the community. Nice and slow, nice and tree-lined. Um, part of the uh, walking and recreation experience, you can ride your bike down those, you can walk down those. Very, very friendly street for the community. Um, I'm going to illustrate some of the other ideas in Foxcroft. Uh, we call these starter ideas. So there's the Foxcroft area. Um, there's the Pike. Uh, there's Orm. There's Ode. And there's Oak. And I had plenty of help. Um, a number of you came uh, on a walkabout with me. We looked at the street. We came up with all sorts of ideas, and you'll see them reflected here. And I also got plenty of help back at the office from, from my friend here. And there's the plan for Foxcroft Heights. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> so, so I took my inspiration from her and, um, and worked on the plan. So there's a bunch of areas in Foxcroft Heights. There's an area along the pike that um, might change. There's the hotel that probably won't change. Um, Orm will probably change a little bit. Even up here along um, Southgate might change. Uh, the, um, but the, the the vast majority of the neighborhood in the middle will probably stay pretty much the same with some modifications. And so the street designs reflect all of those ideas. And there may be a new street someday along here called Nash Street, uh, to particularly to create a, a, a route to get in and out of the base. So here's sort of the um, purposes of the streets. Um, here's Nash Street serving the base mostly. Uh, Orm Street will continue to serve the base a little bit. Um, Orm, Ode, and Oak will all have residential uh, roles, and then of course there'll be a hotel roll down here at the end of Orm Street, about going about halfway up, and then the very tips of Ode and Oak will be used for some commercial uses. And you'll see that the street ideas reflect those uses, and, and these ideas are transferable to any um, neighborhood. So there's the neighborhood again. 
we, we heard lots of issues in the neighborhood, like um, speeding up and down all these streets is an issue, cut through traffic, cut through bus traffic, uh, buses uh, blocking up the street, parking in front of people's driveways, um, parking supply is a big issue, so wrong way travel, all kinds of things going on. Um, here's a house that you can only get to it from these steps, and so there's this no parking zone. So we got a little bit of sign clutter in there. Uh, there's no sidewalks on this street so that if someone parks there, you just can't get into that house. So, you know, obviously you need something, they need, they need this open here. Uh, here's a right turn channel coming out of the base, um, forcing everybody to uh, go up Orm Street. Maybe that doesn't have to be a forced right. So here's our, um, our starter ideas, and they're, and they're just starter ideas, and uh, this is based on uh, the walkabout. So there are the... Um, streets, you'll notice that the ends are a little wider, um, Orm's just a little bit wider, and I'll go through these widths. So in, highlighted in the big thick blue line is Southgate um, to Nash, and it's got, uh, it's 22 feet of clear width, so 11 foot lanes, a little wider than the, um, the usual 20 feet because of the, the base traffic. We've added an extra lane here for queuing. At Christmas time, uh, there's backups coming out of the PX. The, um, the other wider part is to allow the buses to this sort of bus facility that we're thinking about behind the hotel so the buses can come in and out of here so that those lanes are 11 feet. And then the rest of the two-way sections are 20 feet each. So the balance of Orm is 20 feet with the parking on the sides. That's our typical section. Now, this is a really cool part of the plan. At the, um, at the ends, at the commercial ends of the of Ode and Oak, those are um, two-way. The little ends of those streets are two-way, so that when someone comes here to go shopping or into this building, they don't have to leave by going all the way through the neighborhood. They can come in and go out, like mo a lot of them do illegally right now. Um, similarly, <laughs> uh, if you're going to a building over here, you don't have to come all the way through the neighborhood and then go in the building and then and leave. So that will actually reduce a lot of the cut-through traffic in the community by allowing these ends to be two-way. Similarly, towards these larger buildings, where they are, there's already the width up here, they can be two-way as well. And then where the street's skinny in the middle can stay one way at its current uh, width. 